In March of this year, President Donald Trump traveled to meet with his southern voting base in the red state of Alabama. The state had recently suffered through a tornado and his handlers undoubtedly believed this would be a good photo opportunity. While there, his MAGA disciples, his Trumpism apostles, thrust the Holy Bible on him and had him sign pages of scripture as if it were a middle schooler's autograph book. They looked so excited, elated even, to see the president, this president, and to have him participate in this unusual ritual, this mild sacrilege. After all, this is Donald Trump, friend to Christians everywhere and devout Protestant a Presbyterian powerhouse of faith imbued with the humility of Jesus Christ himself. This twice-divorced adulterer, this loathsome creature accused many times of sexual assault, this obvious liar, this even more obvious fraud. How is Donald Trump their guy? If he doesn't behave the way Christ would have him behave, why is he so popular among the flock? Trump may be the least outwardly religious president in modern American history, prompting the least controversial and least confrontational living comedian Jim Gaffigan to remark, I can't believe every woman I know is marching in the streets and CNN is showing Trump pretending to believe in God. According to exit polling from the New York Times, the results of the 2016 general election show that Trump handily won the Catholic vote and even more resoundingly won the Protestant vote. They love him. Or at least they love what he's doing. Nothing beats the Bible. Nothing beats the Bible. Not even the art of the deal. Not even close, okay? Last year saw the release of the latest in the Christian exploitation film assembly line, The Trump Prophecy. It's the true story of real-life firefighter Mark Taylor, during a sabbatical from the department due to PTSD, Mark begins receiving visions from God and the devil. Either that or nightmares consistent with having PTSD, whatever. One night in 2011, Mark falls asleep with the news on so he hears Donald Trump's voice while dreaming. Because of this, Mark concludes that Trump has been chosen by God himself to be the next president of the United States. Much in the same way that God always chooses the Super Bowl winner, Mark's extremely unprofessional doctors help spread this vision of a Trump-led America, starting prayer chains and horn-blowing rituals. Although Trump does not run in 2012, a year after Mark has his dream, he does run in 2016 and wins, turning Mark's nightmare into ours. Mark was right. His vision now proven. After all, he prayed for it to happen. It's not like anyone else in America prayed for their candidate to win. God confirmed. So, is that why Trump won? Because God intervened? Well, no, but Trump's support among God's most radical Christians, white evangelicals, definitely helped. According to The Nation, 81% of white evangelical Protestants, the Christian base of the Republican Party, voted for Trump. Evangelical is superficially a religious designation, not a political one, but it has actually come to be both. It became the common name for the revivals of the 18th and 19th centuries in America. These revivals were not just about waking up current Protestants, but finding new Protestants. Conversion. Immediate conversion, in fact. Evangelicals supposedly adhere to the 19th century revival doctrine of the importance of evangelism and conversion, and the final authority of the Bible. Although America became more secular throughout much of the 20th century, the insertion of religion into politics had a revival of its own. Francis Fitzgerald, author of The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America, explained it like this. When Jimmy Carter, a liberal Southern Baptist, ran for president in 1976, the pollster George Gallup estimated that 50 million Americans were born-again Christians, and Newsweek magazine ran a cover story, Born Again, The Evangelicals. Four years later, the Christian right emerged in force, declaring holy war against secular humanism and vowing to mobilize evangelicals to arrest the moral decay of the country. Jerry Falwell, a fundamentalist pastor, Pat Robertson, a televangelist, and conservative Southern Baptists led the charge against the gay rights movement, abortion, and the banning of school prayer. At an enormous rally in Dallas, Ronald Reagan became their standard bearer and won the presidential election with the help of evangelical votes. 
Speaking of Falwell, The Trump Prophecy is actually a production of Rick Eldridge's Real Work Studios in cooperation with the film department of Liberty University, the evangelical school founded by Falwell himself. But between the election of Jimmy Carter and the prophetic election of Donald Trump, a lot happened with evangelicals and American politics. The formation of evangelicals into a political force rather than a religious sect began with a court ruling against Christian private school Bob Jones University. In 1960, Bob Jones Sr. famously said, If you are against segregation and against racial segregation, then you are against God. In 1971, his school was forced to desegregate, and because of this, powerful Christians began to mobilize evangelicals into a predominantly white and predominantly conservative voting bloc. Evangelical politics are inherently conservative, and though black evangelicals exist, the evangelical movement has been inherently white. The individual is not the same as the movement. In 1979, Jerry Falwell launched The Moral Majority, an organization set up to register conservative Christians to vote and mobilize them against the nascent gay rights movement and reproductive rights. This was furthered along by Christian media like the Christian Broadcasting Network, seen here prominently displayed in The Trump Prophecy. These organizations and denominations combine under the banner of the religious right. This was, and is, not a movement of Christians so much as it was and is a movement of a political ideology in which Christianity was one of the elements or traits, the others including being white, conservative, and Republican. The religious right was not registering American Christians to vote in hopes they will vote Democrat. The religious right is not exclusively evangelical or exclusively white, and evangelicals are not exclusively white or exclusively Republican, but those are still the predominant elements of both the evangelical sect and the religious right. This means that the term evangelical can also be used as a political identification for an ethno-religious group. In an article for The Christian Century, Harry Brunius wrote, as a group, they reveal some of the clearest political positions of any subgroup. Making up around 25% of the population, white evangelicals are by far the group most worried about the threats they see as posed by immigrants. They are by far the most suspicious of Islam. They are by far the most resistant to same-sex marriage. Evangelicals don't want to elect a Christian president. They want to elect a socially conservative Republican, whether he's a devout Christian or not. Barack Obama famously attended church regularly, as evidenced by his pastor being a talking point on the campaign trail, but his Christianity was sometimes spoken of suspiciously by the right and in conspiratorial tones about how he must be a secret Muslim. Obama spoke of his faith often and with sincerity, but he didn't meet the real criteria of the evangelicals. Trump trips over his own words when trying to convince people of his devotion to Christ, but evangelicals adore him anyway. There are a lot of competing theories about why this is. Is it racism? Or an honest mistake? Or racism? Or is it racism? We can't know for sure. In the Trump prophecy, a running joke is that Christian voters say they never cared for Trump, which is supposed to be cute, but is actually telling about their real goals. Evangelicals and the religious right in general do not aim to put a Christian in the White House. That has been mission accomplished for over 200 years. Instead, they aim to put socially conservative presidents in the White House. Obama is not some socialist or leftist. He's a neoliberal, but anyone left of Ronald Reagan is too much for the religious right, regardless of their Christian bona fides. Mary, there's something I need to tell you. I've never been a fan of Donald Trump. The Trump prophecy is split into two parts. The narrative section that makes up over an hour of its runtime and a Talking Heads-style documentary short that makes up the rest. During the narrative portion, Mark never goes into specifics about why Trump should be president outside of it being told to him by God in a dream. He also rarely references actual political issues or talking points. 
Trump just needs to be president, and evangelicals and socially conservative Republicans in general can fill in the blanks as to why that needs to be. Trump's most defining characteristics are his appeals to white nativism, nationalism, and traditionalism. He doesn't have to say anything particularly Christian to appeal to evangelical Christians because the evangelical movement has been more about white nativism, nationalism, and traditionalism than it has been about more Christ-like beliefs like care for the poor. What does Mark even believe anyway? Well, fortunately for us, the character Mark is based on the real-life Mark, and he is very open about his beliefs. I sat down, I put pen to paper just like the Apostle Paul, and I started writing out what the Holy Spirit was telling me. I've been saying all along, if you want to stop all of this right now, arrest George Soros. You cannot just arrest him, but you have to confiscate his assets and his money. That would stop Antifa, Black Lives Matter, all, these, all this money going to Obama's so-called shadow government, the Clintons, all of this stuff would stop. There's your border wall money right there. Donald Trump is a genius. This guy is 10 steps ahead of everyone. He's not going to show his hand as to what he's doing. And this is where the public has to come about. And the, even the evangelicals, they've got to be praying to give this man the sevenfold spirit to understand and deal with the enemy, uh, how it needs to be done and round these people up. But I've been saying all along that it's the goal of man to change, uh, to change their DNA is right. to hand it over to the Luciferian bloodline, basically. Lord, what was the deal with these hurricanes? Because if you notice, these two hurricanes hit Florida and Texas, two of the biggest electoral college uh, votes for Donald Trump. That's no coincidence. These things were gener not generated, but they were steered by man, so to speak, whether it was technology or witchcraft, which we all know witchcraft was behind this. And anytime wow. the Pope says something right now, you can forget it. It's for the new world order right now. Now, did she whiff me a prophecy? No, but <laughs> God spoke to my dog. If America was truly under judgment right now, he would have allowed Hillary Clinton into the White House, and this thing would have been over with by now. And when God reforms the court, God himself will take on that case called Roe versus Wade, and it will be gone. It's the army of God that's dealt with it. California, look what California's going through right now. That's a kind of a type of judgment right now that California's going through. These are some highlights from a 40-minute interview that I had to listen to. Incidentally, I've read some of his prophecies, and they all rhyme. They are rhyming prophecies. <laughs> but maybe Mark is a bit of a straw man. Are evangelicals in general still supporting Trump with such fervor? And what do evangelicals in general even want from Trump? The answer to the first question is a resounding yes. No matter what Trump does, no matter how many children are put in cages, no matter how many revelations about his personal life, no matter what he does that seems to be in direct violation of the teachings of Jesus Christ, evangelicals continue to strongly support Trump. A study from the Public Religion Research Institute from last year showed that 75% of white evangelicals have a positive opinion of Trump. That's 81% white evangelical men and 71% white evangelical women. So what do evangelicals want? Well, they want to win. During the 2016 primaries, Trump's favorability rating among white evangelicals fluctuated at around 30%. It increased dramatically after Trump won the nomination. This is not an anomaly. It happened with Mitt Romney, too. When Romney entered the race, his numbers among white evangelicals were a little low, possibly due to suspicion of his Mormon faith and his dalliances with liberalism. But as soon as he became the nominee, none of that mattered. All that mattered was that Romney was their best bet at curtailing gay rights their best bet at reversing Roe v. Wade, their best bet against a president who they viewed as secretly Muslim, or at least foreign. See, the thing about the evangelical culture is that it is so mired in other traits that evangelicals don't know where their white nativism ends and their belief in the final authority of the Bible begins. Republican partisanship is baked into evangelical identity in America. Remember what Bob Jones Sr. said? If you're against segregation, then you're against God? That's how it works. If you're one of those things, then you're all of those things, and deviation from this norm is anathema. The values voters who judged the candidate by their character are gone, replaced over time by pragmatists. Transactional, utilitarian political ethics. This is reinforced in the Trump prophecy. 
Between the narrative and the documentary short contained within the movie, there is this music video. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's this music video for a song called The Greater Good, and if you think that's a coincidence or I'm looking too deeply into this, the song was written for this movie, and the lyrics were written by the writer and producer of the film, Rick Eldridge. Electing Trump is all for the greater good. The message of the Trump prophecy is that no matter who Trump is, no matter what else Trump does, no matter the cost to our humanity, he's still the best way to get what we want. And yeah, besides winning, they did get a lot from Trump. Namely, access. That's access during the campaign, and now, during his administration. And if we can turn from our wicked ways, we can make America good again, and make America great again. In August of 2016, with the Trump campaign seemingly on its last legs, the Republican candidate pivoted toward gaining the favor of the evangelical voting bloc. He attended an event called Rediscovering God in America Renewal Project, co-hosted by the Liberty Council, a far-right hate group with a focus on anti-LGBT legislation. Mike Huckabee, a Southern Baptist minister, failed presidential candidate, and bad Twitter haver, began to stump for the Trump campaign. Trump began to tell the evangelicals that he would repeal the Johnson Amendment, which prevents churches from endorsing political candidates. Trump once remarked, while on the campaign trail, So go out and spread the word, and once I get in, I will do the thing that I do very well, and I figure it's probably, maybe, the only way I'm going to get to heaven. So I better do a good job. It might be a leap to say that evangelicals tipped the scales in favor of Trump on election day because really so many things had to suddenly go Trump's way for him to win the election. But his coddling of the religious right, particularly the evangelicals, certainly helped. And since becoming president, this relationship has grown even stronger. Trump, whether he himself is religious or not, needs the evangelical base to secure his re-election in 2020. Remember that bit about evangelicals being the demographic that feared immigration the most, hated Islam the most, and denounced same-sex relationships the most? Well, Trump doubled down on all of that. Immigration. His fabled wall is so important to him and his base that he has declared a national emergency to get the funds. Attempts to shut this down have failed so far. And Islam? Well, he has finally won with his Muslim travel ban. And what about same-sex relationships? Alex Azar, Secretary of Health and Human Services, exempted South Carolina from anti-discrimination statutes that protect same-sex couples. And what of abortion, the forever hot topic among Christians? The Trump administration is facilitating access between themselves and the anti-abortion religious right. Azar was interviewed by the president of the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins, at an anti-abortion event called ProLifeCon. The Family Research Council, by the way, is listed as a hate group by the SPLC. Although reproductive rights are the law of the land, that has not stopped the Trump administration from trying to skirt around this to placate their evangelical base. Azar listed victories, new policies that make it difficult to obtain an abortion, including allowing healthcare workers to refuse to treat patients. Perkins famously compares being gay to pedophilia and advocates for the quickly becoming illegal activity of conversion therapy, widely considered among the psychiatric community as a form of torture. Paula White, a televangelist from Florida, is cited as the president's chief spiritual advisor. She has a direct line to the White House, once saying, you can do that because you have a seat there. She's not alone. A Southern Baptist minister and former co-chair of the Trump campaign's Evangelical Advisory Board estimated he'd visited the White House 20 times by 2018. Trump regularly hosts evangelical meetings at the White House. In August of 2018, approximately 100 evangelical leaders were invited to the White House for what was practically an official state dinner. Trump will do anything to hold on to the evangelicals, even lie to their faces. In a closed-door meeting with evangelical leaders last year, Trump repeated his claim that he had gotten rid of the aforementioned law forbidding churches from endorsing political candidates. This is false. The law remains on the books even after attempts by Republicans to kill it. Trump has said to his base, The level of hatred, the level of anger is unbelievable. 
Part of it is because of some of the things I've done for you. They will overturn everything that we've done, and they'll do it quickly and violently. And violently. There's violence. When you look at Antifa and you look at some of these groups, these are violent people. You're not silenced anymore. It's gone, and there's no penalty anymore if you like somebody, or if you don't like somebody, and you can go out and say, this man is going to be great for evangelicals. There is more that evangelicals want besides those handful of things I mentioned. They are really, really into Israel. Like, they are thirsty for Israel. I could explain why, but... <sighs> Honestly, it would take a whole separate video, which I will do one day. There's just no time left in this one. I will leave you today with a quote from Kurt Eichenwald of Newsweek, written a few months before the 2016 election and addressed to then-House Speaker Paul Ryan and far-right conservative James Dobson. The primary issue here is the credibility of evangelicalism, particularly as it relates to politics. For years, there has been a logic to the evangelists' support of the Republican Party. Both held similar views on most social issues, and there was more public discussion by conservative candidates about how faith informed their policies. This year, that is not true. Instead, you have a man whose positions on important social issues have changed, whose faith is obviously shallow, and who seems to know nothing about even the basics of evangelicalism, Christianity, or the Bible. Mr. Dobson, if Donald Trump represents Christian values, those values mean nothing. Vive la France and vive la République and oh, you know, I stand with France. You know, I can't stand with that kind of filth and smut. Amen. I hate adultery. Who hates adultery? I hate adultery. Amen. I hate it. Amen. You know what? I would rather, I would rather die than for my wife to commit adultery. Yeah.